sound. Thank you very much for coming to my online seminar. It's really, uh, and thank you very much, Karen, for arranging everything and for all the help. And it's really very nice to be giving my very first presentation as of uh, working at UCL since July 1st. And this is a really nice opportunity to do that uh, for the TYC, um, the Thomas Young Center. And so today I'd like to tell you about two recent uh, uh, topics that uh, we've been doing in my group. And in particular, one of them being uh, looking at the RNA helicase of uh, the SARS-CoV-2, looking at uh, the structural insights we found so far in our modeling. Much of the research in my group has been motivated by uh, looking at phosphate catalysis. And uh, even though phosphate chemistry is quite simple and just looking at the bone breaking and bone formation of these simple groups is very, very simple chemically, in biology and in life, this is probably one of the most important catalytic reactions that are being used by enzymes. And here we look at various biological processes uh, where um, almost all of them where it's very important in reproduction, energy storage and transfer, signaling, metabolism. And as we can see, even these coronavirus proteins encode as many of these essential enzymes, which we will be talking about, for example, polymerase for reproduction and ATP hydrolysis enzyme RNA uh, helicase that I will be talk about, talking about in more detail. And in particular, in my group, we do QMMM simulations to study these catalytic reactions as well as MD simulations and looking at sampling, which is very challenging for these complex systems, um, especially with uh, DFT-based QMMM calculations. Now, another focus in my group is looking at metal ions and in particular magnesiums and to understand how these magnesium ions are involved in uh, their and what is their essential function in catalyzing these reactions. And I will also be talking about this um, briefly. Um, now to provide a bit more overview of the research that is going on in my group, I only I would like to only mention the, the different areas that we are working on. So one of the key areas is looking at novel enhanced sampling uh, algorithms. And this is very important because of the complexity of the problem and how long QMM simulations take. It's very important to be able to use enhanced sampling simulations. And here we are developing novel algorithms for focusing on Markov state models and coarse graining Markov state models. But today I will not have time to talk about this topic, but I would like to mention one of these new areas that we are working on, looking at irreversible Monte Carlo samplers. Then, as I've already mentioned, we look at phosphate catalysis in biomolecular simulations. And here I will be talking about the RNA helicase of the coronavirus and as one of the examples of um, a catalytic enzyme that uses uh, phosphate catalysis and how we now can use the understanding we have developed of these systems in modeling uh, the structure of this uh, protein. Then um, I will unfortunately not have time today to talk about because this is a very short seminar, but we also work on uh, computational molecular design, looking at materials applications, and these are really nice collaborations with uh, several experimental groups um, in Cambridge. So uh, today, at first, I'd like to tell you about this uh, enhanced sampling algorithms that we have been developing. And these um, are the basis of this is looking at the classical Monte Carlo uh, algorithms uh, from the 1950s developed by Edward Teller. And so here the idea is that we would like to use statistical methods to calculate multidimensional integrals, in particular partition functions, and to find um, relevant um, probability distributions and sample these probability distributions. In pra practice, we want to sample the Boltzmann distribution in our complex systems that we 
are studying. And now here, uh, the most standard uh, approach is using the master Boris Hastings algorithm, where we want to generate a new configuration, uh, xj, and we have an acceptance probability to accept this from our previous configuration, xi, which is um, given by this acceptance probability formula here that everybody knows um, that we call the metropolis hastings uh, criterion here and so what we want to do is to now develop novel ways of generating these uh, probability densities where we can show that we still converge to the correct boltzmann distribution that we want to sample but we can do this in a more efficient way than these uh, original uh, algorithm. And so this project is uh, basically done by Fahim Faizi, a PhD student from the Keynes program, supervised by uh, George Deligin and, and, and me. And what we are looking at is uh, irreversible Monte Carlo algorithms where we can sample um, these probability distributions in a, uh, in a different way, which is uh, leads to some irreversibility in the algorithm that maybe we could picture as making a duplicate of our system, which will have um, a flow in one direction, and then the other counterpart will have a flow in the other direction. So the overall system would not be reversible, but the final distribution that we would like to find would still be the correct distribution. And this is just a picture but what we do in practice is the following. So um, the idea is that we want to uh, satisfy the balance condition, which is given here in this equation. And so this condition would tell us would be the necessary and sufficient condition to make sure that we have the target distribution. Now, this is most typically satisfied through reversible algorithms where the detailed balance condition is satisfied. This, however, this is not necessarily a required condition only if we want to look at reversible algorithms. However, in this case, we want to look at irreversible algorithms where this detailed balance condition is not satisfied. And the way to do that, we are using the lifting framework of Turitzin et al. And the idea of this framework is that we can imagine our system as a kinetic network of various nodes. And now we make a copy of this system by essentially assigning a, a spin to each of our um, states or our nodes of the of the network and then this could have the value of plus one or minus one and all other connectivities would be otherwise the same and so what we can do here is now we can define the transition matrix on this new extended space and then um, this new transition matrix would have our intra intra replica transitions here which is denoted by this t plus and t minus which would be just our normal transitions within the network itself and then to actually change the spin we could also make a move which is this inter replica transitions where we could go from a j state which had the plus one spin to a j state which now has this epsilon equals minus one and uh, <clears throat> so therefore, this uh, lambda is a diagonal uh, matrix of transition probabilities. And now if we construct this matrix appropriately, then we can ensure that even though detailed balance condition is not uh, satisfied within uh, one of these uh, transition uh, matrices, but uh, the skewed detailed balance condition would be instead uh, satisfied. So therefore, within one of these networks, we would have a flow which is um, a co compensated with the flow, with the irreversible flow on the other side or on the other counterpart. And so we can, what it can be shown is that if we satisfy this skewed detailed balance condition, which uh, looks like this, then um, this will lead to satis also a, satisf a satisfaction of the balance condition. So then we, this will ensure that we will have the right target distribution. Now to 
and accomplish this, we will be using the lifting framework originally developed by Turicin et al. And to do that, we will modify our original transition probability matrix Tij with, by multiplying with a skewness function. And this skewness function has to um, satisfy the following two properties. It has to be a probability between 0 and 1. And it has to have this asymmetric property here that we need to make sure is correct. And once we have such a function, then we can um, ensure that skewed detail balance is satisfied, so we have the right equilibrium distribution. And then we can choose this skewness function in such a way that we would achieve a more optimal sampling. So um, originally, we started this project by generalizing Sakai and Huhu. Fukushima's method, which was developed for the Ising model, the skewness function that was developed for the Ising model. And so we generalize this where the spins can take uh, more values, not just uh, two. And so then this allows us to generalize it to uh, more complex systems. And in addition, just to looking at the Metropolis Hastings type of acceptance probability, we also uh, applied these al irreversible algorithms to the Gibbs sampler, where if we already know the target distribution, the relative probabilities of our proposed uh, new states, then we can draw from that distribution so the move will always be accepted. And an even faster um, and more efficient uh, version of this is if we use the metropolized Gibbs sampler, where we basically want to uh, stay in the current state as little as possible, so we exclude the current state in our proposition, and then we use a metropolis um, algorithm to accept that move and otherwise we use the Gibbs sampler to move to another new state. So we have developed a more generalized um, version of these uh, irreversible algorithms using uh, the Metropolis Hastings, the Gibbs sampler, and the metropolized Gibbs sampler algorithm in our recent paper in JCTC. And we applied it to the Ising model, to the POTS model, the generalized version of the Ising and also we applied it to a, a two-state um, system with a simple 1D model potential. So this was our simple 1D model potential shown here. And when we model it, this is, these are the trajectories that we can get. So this is the reversible uh, Metropolis Monte Carlo algorithm. You can see here the trajectories along X. So we stay either the, in the valley corresponding to minus one or in the valley corresponding to plus one. And we can see this two-state behavior with very few exchanges um, and um, and um, mostly staying in the in the metastable states. Now, if we use our irreversible sampling algorithm, keeping everything else the same, we can see that now we see many more transitions of the system. And then these transitions also uh, translate then into a smaller error. So this is the variance in measuring the free energy profiles uh, here with the two methods. And we can see that generally we have smaller errors measuring um, this uh, potential and also the correlation function, the autocorrelation function corresponding to the simulations is faster in this case, uh, looking at the X coordinate. <coughs> so we have a more efficient uh, version of our uh, irreversible sampler, which can be seen. And also what we can um, Says that yet it's at the same cost as uh, what the cost was for the reversible up. We have also adapted irre these irreversible sampling algorithms for simulated tampering. And this is the example on the same 1D model potential where we looked at 32 temperatures. And what we can see is that uh, in the standard Metropolis Hastings, the temperatures are sampled slower than in our irreversible Metropolis Hastings on in the, or in the irreversible metropolized Gibbs sampler algorithm. Similarly, the X coordinate, the potential, uh, the position is sampled here more frequently um, in the irreversible algorithms. And this is also shown if we plot the autocorrelation functions of the temperatures or of the energy. Another example where we have applied it to is the Alanine uh, 5 
in explicit water. Second, we tried here the three algorithms and we see an enhanced sampling of the temperature range again. And what we also see is that the autocorrelation functions of the energy are also um, improved compared to the standard um, uh, reversible metropolis Hastings. Now to summarize this part, um, we have developed these novel irreversible Monte Carlo methods based on Turitsin's original work and generalizing Sakai and Fukushima's um, uh, skewness function uh, to general uh, spin systems. And uh, this is now, uh, we are now able to use any observables of interest for this lifting coordinate. And uh, this allows us to also construct not just um, the metropolis system, but looking at also the Gibbs sampler and the metropolized Gibbs sampler that provide even further enhancement in this case. And um, we could also generalize these uh, Monte Carlo methods to simulate tampering. I'd like to come back now to the biomolecular simulations and in particular looking at magnesium it is not only important uh, as, an, as it has an essential function for catalysis, but uh, it is also very important structurally to bind drug molecules and to help inhibitor design. And here are three examples of uh, small molecules inhibitors to bind directly the metal ions. Uh, an example of on HIV integrase, one of the that binds some of the best drug molecules that patients can take for 20 plus years, making AIDS a chronic disease. Then a RNAs H, which we have looked at the catalytic mechanism of this classic two metal ion catalyzed enzyme in the past. And also another example is an antibiotic um, here, cycloserine bound to these two magnesium ions in the alanine, the alanine ligase against, used against tuberculosis, which here we have an ongoing project with the, the Luis Carvalho's lab at the Crick Institute. I would like to further come back to this work with uh, uh, Peter Cherepanov lab at the Crick Institute um, here. So in the Cherepanov lab, lab, they were able to um, find some excellent resolution cryo-EM structures for both the wild type HIV integrase, as well as um, this double mutant, which um, where these two mutations lead to drug resistance. So basically when uh, this uh, glutamine and uh, glycine is uh, mutated, even though they are very far actually from the drug molecules, they uh, lead to the drug resistance of the first generation compounds, while the second generation drugs are very little affected. And when we looked at these structures, what we could tell is that there is a hydrogen bonding network, which is even further stabilized by this quite far uh, serine uh, mutation. And this uh, hydrogen bonding network interacts with the glutamate residue that coordinates one of these important catalytic magnesium ions. And that leads to a weakening of the drug molecule to these metal ions. And a slight change also in the coordination of these metal ions that can be seen, for example, in how this water molecule here is uh, dislocated. And then this change in the water position and water flexibility and the general flex, uh, increased flexibility of this pocket can also be seen by, for example, following the distance of this water molecule to these uh, carboxylate groups that coordinate the magnesium ions. And what we can see is that in these double mutants, we see exchange of this water molecule and much more flexibility in comparison with the wild type. And this leads together with the, this leads to this uh, drug resistance and also the difference between the way these two molecules, first and second generation drugs uh, respond to these changes can also be explained by how tightly they are packed in this active site. And, and as there is a short of, shortness of time, I would like to quickly tell you about uh, some of the recent work that we have been doing. Now looking at the SARS uh, coronavirus encoded enzymes. And here there is um, one, a very long um, 
polypeptide is encoded by the RNA of, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which, um, which encodes several proteins. And uh, there are several that uh, have been used already as uh, targets for um, drug discovery, like the proteases or structural proteins, these spike proteins. However, there are quite important essential enzymes that are encoded here that have to do with phosphate catalysis. And one of these is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, which is the target of remdesivir, the approved, currently approved uh, drug for um, COVID-19. Now, the other enzymes that, um, that follow this are uh, NSP13 and RNA helicase, NSP14 and NSP15 that are also phosphate catalytic enzymes, exoribonuclease and endoribonucleases. Now, what we have decided is to look at the helicase because this enzyme is quite different structurally than the human enzymes. The closest um, structural homologue is only about 26% uh, homologous. So it is a very promising uh, drug target, as it would likely not inhibit the human enzyme. Uh, the function of this enzyme is to help unwind double-stranded RNA, and it is done by the help of ATP. So ATP binds uh, these at the interface of these two domains called RAK1 and RAK2 domains, and it pulls a single-stranded RNA chain from the five prime to the three prime direction, while uh, hydrolyzing ATP to ADP and phosphate. Now, when we wanted to study the structure of this enzyme, uh, we have found that there is an available uh, structure, which is an apodimer for a SARS -CoV, for the SARS-CoV um, uh, virus, but essentially it has the same sequence. So we basically have already an APO structure available from 2019 for this NSP13 RNA helicase. And then in the meantime, while we were working on this project, there has become a structure available for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And also importantly, just a couple of days ago, this new structure came out, uh, which is a cryo-EM structure um, that has the uh, RNA-dependent uh, RNA um, polymerase and the helicase bound in one complex with ATP bound in the helicase, however, no RNA. So when we wanted to study this enzyme, we only had the APO structure available. And what we have already seen is that it has uh, three domains. Its very first domain here uh, is uh, has a sequence which is very, very different than any of the other sequences of other organisms. So what we have done is we looked at uh, over 900 sequences that are homologous to the sequence of um, our RNA helicase. And then we looked at uh, the sequence alignments and we looked at the homology. And only about 100 of these sequences showed any kind of similarity to this first domain. So basically, there is uh, there is only exist of about 100 sequences in the various organisms corresponding to coronaviruses or nidoviruses. So therefore, targeting this uh, part of the protein or anything, any uh, pockets that might have to uh, interact with this domain one would be very, very highly specific to coronaviruses, as there are no other organisms that have a sequence similarity to this domain. On the other hand, rak one and rak 2 domains are the typical uh, domains uh, that bind the ATP and help hydrolyze, uh, hydrolyze it to for the translocation of the RNA. And so these have sequence similarities. And also what we know is that we already, uh, that there is this D, that this dead box helicases or DE motif, which is the key catalytic motif where this glutamate binds the, uh, where the glutamate helps cleave that uh, water molecule, coordinate the catalytic water molecule and is the most likely proton acceptor for that process for the ATP hydrolysis. And this aspartate here is very important for the coordination of the magnesium. Now, um, to be able to have a catalytically competent structure where we are able to model ATP and the RNA, we have been looking at already available 
coordinating structures. And to do that, we have looked at uh, the coordinating residues that are near the ATP binding and where we can see that they are very highly conserved. Then we took the available structures, which show very small sequence similarities, and we took these structures and the, the closest one had only 11% similarity. So, um, with the help of these structures, we were able to um, model our ATP binding pocket. And what we see here is that this phosphate group here is coordinated with the magnesium several arginine fingers. And this DE motif here shows the uh, aspartate coordinating the serine and the water molecule that directly coordinates the magnesium, as well as this, this glutamine that co co glutamate that coordinates the catalytic water molecule. At the, um, so unfortunately, this uh, binding pocket therefore is not very good for drug discovery because this uh, is a very negative uh, recharge ligand, which is not a good uh, ligand for uh, drug purposes. So and unfortunately, this uh, 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 the purine part of the ATP is not very specifically recognized, and there are only really a few groups that interact with that. And the reason for that is that uh, this enzyme is actually uh, has a second function, an ATP and NTPase function, which helps for the capping uh, function uh, to um, create the RNA. And uh, so it basically accepts any kind of NTP. Uh, nucleotide triphosphate molecules that it can then hydrolyze them. Therefore, the, this end of the ATP is not uh, very well recognized. Now, to model also the RNA, we looked at the available crystal structures and we identified that the RNA binds very, very similarly in all available structures with the 3' prime end um, coordinating the RECA1 domain and the 5' prime ends coordinating the RECA2 domain. And with that, we were able to build a homologous uh, structure for the ATP, for the RNA. However, the problem with this is that um, the RNA recognition is um, not very um, uh, conserved, as many of the interactions are done by the backbone of the protein, and therefore the side chain is not is, doesn't need to be conserved. Nevertheless, when we looked at the conservations, we've identified some Cretonian residues, both in the RECA1 domain here, and then in the RECA2 domain, which are highly conserved and show here also structurally, you know, so in the sequence alignments to the existing crystal structures of other helicases. So that helps us to uh, position the RNA. And with that, we were able to model both APO simulations. Here we have um, already a microsecond uh, long simulations of the APO um, helicase dimer. And then also we are able to model our complex with the RNA and the ATP bound. And now, um, in the future, we are also working with the John DeFries group, who have been uh, experimentally identifying inhibitors. They have used a library of around 6,000 small molecules, um, many of them FDA-approved drugs at the Crick Institute. And they have looked at uh, how these molecules can inhibit NSP13 and identified already several promising inhibitors. And we would like to see how these inhibitors bind and find a structure-based um, reason for this inhibition to be able to further design these compounds. Um, so with that, and I would like to thank uh, everybody who contributed to this work. And in fact, the work on the coronavirus was a very, very nice collaboration, which from the start we had some fantastic uh, volunteers who were helping us and we were doing all the simulations together and identifying problems and solving these problems uh, together. And um, here is the list of uh, people, Sarah Harris from Lees, Jeff Wells from UCL, Nadia El Gobashi Meinhardt from Technical University Berlin, Elisa Freza from Paris, Andrei Pishliakov from the University of Dundee, as well as two of my students, uh, Dana Sperta and Majid Badawi, and also volunteers from different um, 
areas, Thomas Meltzer and Rachel Kerber, which we thank them very much, as well as experimental groups, the COP group to perform synthesis of small molecules and the Sanderson group for uh, structural and biochemical characterization of the helicase. With that, I would like to thank again my group members, um, Margit and Dana, as I have mentioned, and Pedro, who has been contributing to both of these projects, and uh, all collaborators, I couldn't talk about the that project and thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions.